Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. Did you know China spends more on its police force than it does its entire military? That's because the greatest threat to the Chinese Communist Party isn't a foreign invasion. It's unhappy Chinese people. Of course, calling it the police force doesn't really do it justice. I'm talking about the entire internal security apparatus. That includes regular police, secret police, black jails, the whole kid and caboodle. China's internal security is run by a powerful organization called the Political and Legal Affairs Commission, or PLAC. To be clear, the PLAC is part of the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese government. But it controls all of the law enforcement in China. Chinese leader Xi Jinping is about to begin a major purge of the PLAC. That's because later this year will be the 20th Party Congress, the biggest meeting of the Chinese Communist Party. And at that meeting, Xi hopes to make himself presentator for life. So once again, it's time for everyone's favorite communist soap opera, General Hostility. Previously on General Hostility, corruption and purges, Xi Jinping fights for control of the PLAC from his arch nemesis, former Chinese leader and toad eater Jiang Zemin. Millions are purged in Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, and a new wave of purges is about to begin. Former Chinese leader Jiang Zemin used the PLAC to create a stranglehold over China's internal security apparatus. He did that by launching a persecution of the Falun Gong spiritual practice. It's a buddhist -y Chinese Qigong practice. Like yoga, but less stretchy. But what you need to know is, according to official government estimates, at its height, there were up to 100 million people practicing Falun Gong. More people than were members of the Communist Party. Jiang Zemin felt Falun Gong was a threat. And he convinced the rest of the party there needed to be a crackdown. And he used the crackdown to create a supremely powerful security apparatus that answered only to him and his cronies. And this security apparatus proved very dangerous for Xi Jinping when he came to power in 2012. The head of the PLAC when Xi came to power was a man named Zhou Yang Kong, a close ally of Jiang. He and other top Jiang allies attempted a coup against Xi. They failed. Xi Jinping threw Zhou in prison for life. And even worse, he took away his hair dye. But even after that, Jiang was still powerful enough to get another one of his guys to be the head of the PLAC, Meng Jianju. So, enter Chen Yixin. He's a close ally of Xi. In 2017, Xi got him promoted to a high-ranking position within the PLAC. And he announced a purge of corrupt elements within the PLAC. He said, the PLAC teams in the whole country are impure, unjust, and lack executive force. Some members even violate law and discipline. They're bad horses, have bad impact, and have done great damage. Wow, bad horses, what a takedown. Speaking of takedowns, that purge ended up bringing down China's ex-secret police boss, who was a close assistant to former PLAC head Meng Jianju, the Jiang guy. I'd be worried if I were Meng. And now it looks like Chen will be busy enforcing China's new anti-organized crime law. What does organized crime have to do with Xi Jinping purging his political opponents? I'll explain more after the break. Welcome back. So what does China's new anti-organized crime law have to do with Chen Yixin and Xi Jinping's political purge? Simple. Umbrellas. Let me explain. We recently did an episode about a massive Shanghai sex trafficking ring. It operated for 20 years. Why didn't police, you know, do something about it? Because top officials were in on it. Really in on it. They're what Chen Yixin calls protective umbrellas. In fact, before he began his massive purge of the PLAC, Chen started with a three-year anti-vice crackdown on criminals and triad societies in China. 
as well as law enforcement officers who colluded with criminals. In other words, corruption is so bad in China that if you go after organized crime, you'll also have to go after law enforcement officials and members of the PLAC. In that three-year campaign, some 67,000 law enforcement officers who acted as protective umbrellas for criminals were investigated and prosecuted as a result of that crackdown. So with everything riding on the line in this year's 20th Party Congress, it's not surprising that Xi Jinping has passed a new anti-organized crime law. My guess is that Chen Yixin will be spending this year doing a lot more purging of the PLAC. And it looks like Chen's loyalty to Xi will be rewarded. At the Party Congress later this year, many expect him to be promoted into the Politburo and even made head of the PLAC. Remember, Chen right now is just a high-ranking official within the PLAC, not the actual top dog. It's even possible Chen could conceivably get a super promotion into the Politburo Standing Committee as Central Discipline Inspection Commission Head or as Central Secretariat Secretary. In other words, Xi Jinping will have his people in place to fully control China's entire security apparatus, which, remember, is bigger than the Chinese military. And now it's time when I answer questions from you, my loyal 50 cent army, fans of the show who support what we do through the crowdfunding website's Patreon or the exclusive social media platform, Locals. DPR of DC asks on Locals, both Hypnotoad and Pooh have loyal security forces that appear focused on removing each other's allies. Is there a chance general hostility will become a less civil and more pointed grudge match? Now that is a very interesting question. The answer depends on how far down the conspiratorial rabbit hole you want to go. There have been rumors for a long time that the grudge match is already going on. A few months ago I did an episode about a series of 10 explosions that happened across China in just a week. Some have claimed these are actual attacks carried out by the Jiang faction. That was also a conspiracy theory some were talking about after the massive explosion in Tianjin back in 2015. There were also those coup attempts against Xi Jinping I mentioned earlier. It wouldn't be the first time Jiang had been accused of trying to take down a rival. There were rumors Jiang tried to assassinate his successor, Hu Jintao, back in 2006. According to a Hong Kong media report, Hu was inspecting a naval fleet in Qingdao when some of the ships fired on his ship. The problem is we have no way of proving whether any of this actually happened. But I imagine the more desperate the Jiang faction gets, the more willing they'll be to try desperate measures. Needless to say, the Party Congress in November will be a very interesting time. What's that, Shelley? November is also the U.S. midterm elections. Never mind, November will be a very busy time. Thanks for your question, DPR of DC, and for your support. And thanks to all of you for watching. Consider joining the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army. You'll have a chance to ask me questions on the show, and there are some other cool perks as well. Check out patreon.com slash China Uncensored, or chinauncensored.locals.com to learn more. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time. Illidan versus Uther. I will fight with honor. This ends now. 发现目标有罪,你犯了体力不足罪 China completes an artificial moon More power battles at the highest level of the Chinese Communist Party And sinister developments at the Olympics Then more on this week's China News Headlines Welcome to China Uncensored. 
I'm Chris Chappell. China has built an artificial moon. And this is not a joke. It was inspired by a 20-year-old experiment that used magnets to levitate a frog. Strike now! King is looking for ways to deal with a certain pesky toad. Send him to the moon. But China's artificial moon might not quite be what you're imagining. These are the schematics. It's a vacuum chamber housing a two-foot-wide artificial moon made up of rocks and dust. The magnets essentially recreate the gravity on the moon, a sixth of what it is on Earth. When the field is strong enough, it can magnetize and levitate things, from a living frog to a chestnut against the gravitational force. Why are scientists so into levitating frogs? Anyway, this artificial moon is the first of its kind, according to the lead scientist right now. the China University of Mining and Technology. The artificial moon what? will allow Chinese scientists to simulate a testing environment very similar to the moon, where rocks and dust can behave in a completely different way than they do on Earth. There is no atmosphere on the moon, temperature can change quickly and dramatically, and in low gravity, soil particles are more loosely bound to each other. And the Chinese Communist Party has some very ambitious moon plans. They want to land astronauts on the moon by 2030. And there's some talk of a China-Russia moon base. In other words, those two can be very interesting. Speaking of the new Cold War, Britain's MI5 has warned that a Chinese agent has infiltrated parliament. An alert from the security service said Christine Ching Kui Li established links for the Chinese Communist Party with current and aspiring MPs. Christine Li is a London based solicitor. According to MI5, she knowingly engaged in political interference activities on behalf of the United Front Work Department of the Chinese Communist Party. Li also gave donations to politicians with funding from foreign nationals in China and Hong Kong. According to the BBC, this is the result of a long-run investigation. Now, it's important to note that Li has so far not been accused of doing anything illegal. There aren't really laws in the UK against the type of foreign interference Li seems to have been involved in, which is one reason it's so easy for the Chinese Communist Party to interfere in the UK and democracy. And after the break, Chinese leader Xi Jinping that gives his mistake. first marching orders to the Chinese military this year. Welcome back. It's a brand new year, but for Chinese leader Xi Jinping, it's not a time for resolutions. The it's time for me. issuing his first orders of the year to the military. As the head of the People's Liberation Army, which is the Communist Party military, she told troops to keep an eye on the changes in national security we'll and military fine. struggle, and the changes in technology, warfare, and opponents. She did not specify who those opponents are. I'll let you speculate. However, at the end of the year, there's going to be a major meeting of the Communist Party. And if you've been watching everyone's favorite communist soap opera, General Hostility, you know that means internal power struggles within the Communist Party. In previous years, she had been focused on military threats from foreign countries and warfare preparation. This year, it was a lot more vague, almost as if some of those threats could not be from foreign countries, maybe from Xi's internal political enemies. The day after Xi gave the military its orders, Xi's close ally, Wang Xiaohong, secretary of the party committee of the Ministry of Public Security, published this article in party mouthpiece, The People's Daily. It says That's public security departments should be guided by Xi Jinping thought and crush all kinds of attempts to endanger political security. Yeah, sounds like the factional infighting in the Communist Party is going to be pretty intense this year. Can't wait for the next episode of General Hostility. Speaking of elite power competitions, the Winter Olympics are just three weeks away. And China is making a show of opening up the internet for it. China has the most repressive internet control in the world. With 
Chinese regime has promised Olympic athletes free access to social media platforms and other websites in the Olympic Village in Beijing. Again, just the foreign athletes and just while they're in the Olympic Village. But even still, experts expect heavy surveillance of online activity to continue, hmm. even for visitors who are allowed to access sites that would otherwise be blocked. You know, for any foreign athlete who might be thinking of taking some kind of stand for human rights, the Chinese internet police would get word of that. And then, the biathlon contestants might have something more interesting to shoot at. Speaking of Olympic surveillance, espionage is also a concern for athletes. Dutch athletes have been warned not to bring their phones or laptops to China for just that reason. Dutch team members will be equipped with unused devices to protect their personal data from Chinese surveillance. As you can imagine, the Chinese are mistaken the news really well. My favorite state-run media, the Global Times, criticized the Netherlands by bringing up the NSA, accusing America of getting a Tibetan activist to influence the Dutch Olympic Committee and dissing the Netherlands' COVID response. Look, it makes sense if you work for the Global Times. And coming up after the break, China's zero COVID policy is in more trouble. Hey, loser! Welcome back. COVID is a particular concern of the Chinese regime during the Olympics. China has begun handing out jail terms as long as four years for people violating draconian lockdown measures. The sad thing is, millions of Chinese citizens have become complicit in enforcing China's insane zero COVID policy. In Xi'an, hospital employees refused to admit a man suffering from chest pains because he lived in a medium risk district. He died of a heart attack. In another case, hospital workers refused well, to admit fine. a woman who was bad. eight months pregnant and bleeding because her COVID test wasn't valid. She lost her baby. Two community security guards told a young man they didn't care that he had nothing to eat after catching him out during the lockdown. They beat him up. It's amazing what people will do simply because someone in power told them to do it, or paid them to do it. However, China is ordering civil servants across the country to tighten their belts. Local governments across the country are cutting back on a range of perks and bonuses in order to drive to reduce costs. So maybe they'll stop enforcing draconian policies if there's no money. Earlier this week, we did an episode on how China's zero COVID policy is falling apart. Check it out if YouTube somehow forgot to let you know about it. In that episode, I mentioned that China's zero COVID policy is unsustainable. So they're starting to do things like call it societal zero COVID instead, which means there's still COVID. And as Bloomberg points out, the Communist Party is playing more word games I too. Grow According to the government, COVID zero is no longer China's policy goal. Rather, it's aiming for dynamic clearing, which relies on local governments to stamp out local outbreaks. And if you're thinking that dynamic clearing sounds exactly like COVID zero, but with an easier way to blame I local governments for impatient. failing? You'd be right. I bet local officials are loving this, especially as outbreaks continue to spread across China. Yet another wonderful sign for Hong Kong. The former security chief of Xinjiang, you know, where there's all the mass surveillance and genocide. Yeah, he's been put in charge of the Chinese army garrison in Hong Kong. That'll go well. In some good news for a change, Taiwan continues to ramp up its support for Lithuania. Lithuania has been facing economic attacks from the Chinese Communist Party because the government supported Taiwan. Taiwan this week announced a $1 billion Lithuania credit fund to enhance economic cooperation between the two countries. Meanwhile, Lithuania's foreign minister has called on the EU to stand up to China. Taiwan and Lithuania. Not the heroes we deserved, but the heroes we need. China continues to encroach on the border with Bhutan, with new construction across six new sites. Satellite images show a massive buildup, over 200 new structures. This area has a lot of strategic value for the Chinese military. It's at the junction of the borders of India, Bhutan, and China, where Indian and Chinese troops were locked in standoff for more than two months in 2017. 
So we expect to hear China having more border conflicts with India in 2022. And now is the time when I answer questions from you, my loyal 50 cent army, fans of the show who support what we do through the crowdfunding website Patreon or the exclusive social media platform Locals. LOL No asks on Patreon, do you think companies are going to move outside of China and start more factories in the EU instead? It would be interesting to see what would happen if factories would stop selling to China and start only selling in EU, US, and countries with no connection to China. That's a very good question. Actually, during the Trump administration, we noticed a lot of companies were beginning to move their supply chains out of China. However, they weren't exactly bringing manufacturing back to America, or even the EU. Most set up shops in other Asian countries. I started to see a lot more things than you we know. Recently, the U.S. passed the Weaver Forced Labor Prevention. That should also encourage more Western companies to get their supply chain out of China, or else risk violating U.S. law. Not to mention, if China keeps locking down because of COVID cases, more companies are going to need to switch their supply chain or risk never getting their products out of China. Ultimately, this might mean consumers will have more opportunities to buy things not made in China, which would be great. We're actually working on a new YouTube channel that helps people find products that are not made in China. Is that something you're interested in? Let us know in the comments. Thank you for your question and your support. LOL no. And for all of you watching, consider joining the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army. You'll have a chance to ask me questions on the show and there are some other cool questions. Check out patreon.com slash chinauncensored or chinauncensored.locals.com to learn more. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time. China has a zero COVID policy. They're not backing down, even if it destroys the economy. Victory is Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. The Chinese Communist Party has staked their reputation on controlling the coronavirus. They're basically the only country in the world still sticking with a zero COVID policy. That means they're trying to stamp out the virus with quarantines and lockdowns. And their zero COVID policy is doing great, according to themselves. But others have bought into the Chinese regime's claims as well. And from the very beginning of the pandemic, in March 2020, Nature magazine ran this article about what China's coronavirus response can teach the rest of the world, which specifically mentioned countries looking at whether China's extreme lockdowns worked to contain the virus. I've talked before about how the Chinese Communist Party's authoritarian coronavirus policies influenced the rest of the world. Even medical journals like The Lancet published articles about China's successful control of COVID-19. And Western media have said China has COVID-19 well contained. Of course, all these articles rely on official Chinese statistics for how many people got or died from COVID. First of all, no one in China trusts official Chinese statistics, not even Chinese officials. But even if you believe China has pretty much contained most of its coronavirus outbreaks since the initial outbreak in Wuhan, it's clear the infection numbers in Wuhan were undercounted, even according to Chinese researchers. Dark ones and deaths in Wuhan all. were far higher than the official count, too. And yet, so many people in the West still believe China's COVID. Now, it's understandable that at the beginning of the outbreak, it would have been hard to accurately count all infections. But that's not the only reason for China's undercounting of COVID cases. The Chinese Communist Party always penalizes lower-level officials for policy failures while protecting the party leadership. 
That incentivizes officials at every level to cover up bad news so they don't get punished. It also incentivizes officials to take extreme measures to carry out orders from party leaders so they don't get punished. So when Chinese leaders say they want zero COVID, local officials are going to deliver zero COVID, at least according to official numbers. But even as Chinese officials double down on zero COVID, there are signs it's falling apart. I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. China's zero COVID policy is facing a backlash, especially in Xi'an, a city of 13 million people. It's entering its third week of a strict lockdown. More than 42,000 people have been sent to quarantine, and no one in the city is allowed to leave their home. That's led to a few issues, like residents saying they don't have enough food, while officials insist there are adequate supplies. We'll be fine. Only who to believe, the starving big. residents or the official who will be punished if people don't have food. Other stories emerge, like hundreds of people being forced out of their apartments in the middle of the night and sent to quarantine camps, where people complained they didn't have heat or supplies. As more and more complaints were posted online, the Xi'an authorities stepped in to solve the problem by banning online comments. Hmm. Communism is truly the best system. In a mass text message sent to the city, authorities announced from January 4th, people are banned from posting details of the pandemic restrictions, particularly negative news. And they also reminded everyone that they were being watched and any negative news would be automatically deleted. But you can understand why Xi'an authorities are so sensitive. No need to worry. After all, the more I bad publicity worry. their lockdown gets, the more likely they're no. going to be punished. And while most people in China seem to have supported the Communist Party's zero COVID policy, the harsh restrictions in Xi'an have led to not just local complaints, but a nationwide backlash. The turning point seems to have been after at least two Xi'an women in late stages of their pregnancies lost unborn babies because they were denied access to medical attention. A relative of one of the women had posted a video of her bleeding outside the hospital that refused to treat her because her negative COVID test had expired. But don't worry, that'll never happen again because Xi'an authorities will automatically delete that negative news. Just like they deleted those women's babies. Actually, I'm good, good news though for the people of Xi'an, all of their sacrifices yeah. were worth it because the community spread of COVID-19 nice. has been basically blocked in Xi'an. Yeah, hold up. Basically blocked? What does basically mean? Xi'an has basically stopped the spread of COVID-19. The virus spread in communities had been basically cut Actually, off. I'm good here. It sounds like it's not really cut off. Chinese officials have called it achieving zero COVID on a societal level. What? According to officials, all the new cases found were among the people who were quarantined at designated places or at home. So people are still getting COVID but only people who have already been quarantined at camp or at home. That's what they're calling zero COVID on a societal level. Boy, man, isn't everyone in Xi'an quarantined at camp or at home? No one can spread COVID at a societal level when you've completely shut down society. Zero COVID on a societal level is not zero COVID. You've moved the goalposts so far, they're not even on the football field anymore. And speaking of moving, apparently, one way Xi'an officials are achieving societal zero COVID is by literally moving residents out of the city. Hey, technically those COVID cases are not in Xi'an anymore. Just like technically there's no more negative news about Xi'an lockdowns. is true. Changing zero COVID to societal zero COVID seems to be admitting that the zero COVID policy isn't working so well anymore. So why is the Chinese Communist Party sticking with zero COVID? Because they have to. I'll explain why after the break. Welcome back. Everyone knows the Chinese Communist Party is never wrong, at least according to themselves. 
Party leaders have staked their political legitimacy on controlling the coronavirus. And after spending so long talking about how much better they're doing than Western countries, they can't back down. This is one reason the Eurasia Group has called China's zero COVID policy one of the biggest risks to the world in 2022. They're predicting that China's zero COVID policy Holiday will fail, to you. but there's nothing China can do about it. The initial success of zero COVID and Chinese leader Xi Jinping's personal attachment to it makes it impossible to change course. So that's the political reason the Chinese regime can't give up on zero COVID. There's a practical reason too. Chinese officials say they vaccinated over 1.2 billion stop. people. The Chinese COVID vaccines are less effective than Western vaccines, especially at controlling transmission. Right now. And they haven't developed as many treatments for COVID either. So if they do ease their zero COVID policy, they could be looking at skyrocketing outbreaks, especially with the new Omicron variant. China might be stuck in a cycle of more and more outbreaks, leading to more and more severe lockdowns. In fact, My we may already be seeing this. Omicron has surfaced in Tianjin, a city of 14 million near Beijing. Tianjin is on partial lockdown. And Omicron has spread from Tianjin to the city of Anyang in Henan. And Anyang is now completely locked down as well. That means 20 million people in three cities are under full lockdown, not even counting Tianjin's partial lockdown. There's also a separate Delta outbreak happening in Shenzhen in southern China. And entry into Shenzhen is now being restricted. As more and more lockdowns happen, it's going to be a big problem for China's economy. And not just China's economy. Shenzhen is a major manufacturing hub. If it locks down, that will affect supply chains around the world. Even Xi'an's lockdown is hitting major microchip manufacturers. But even though continued lockdowns could destroy China's economy, the Communist Party isn't going to stop anytime soon. Next week, the traditional Chinese New Year travel rush begins. Tens of millions of people usually travel home to see family. But while there aren't any nationwide restrictions on travel so far, I wouldn't be surprised if local officials tried to restrict people entering or leaving for the New Year. After all, they don't want to get punished if an outbreak happens in their area. And guess what's happening at the same time as Chinese New Year? The Winter Olympics, which will be held in Beijing in less than a month. Did I mention that Tianjin is pretty close to Beijing? It's 30 minutes away by train. I have a feeling that Tianjin is going to get locked down real soon because a massive Omicron outbreak at the Winter Olympics could be a political disaster for the Chinese Communist Party. Although on the plus side, if there is an outbreak, the party can just blame the foreigners. Communism is truly the best system. And now it's time for me to answer a question from a member of the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army, a fan who supports the show on the crowdfunding websites Patreon and Locals. To thank them, I answer a question at the end of each episode. Thomas Adney asks, how can the Olympics be COVID-free? Good question, Thomas. Chinese authorities have basically designed a giant COVID bubble. On the Chinese side, thousands of game related staff, volunteers, cleaners, cooks, and coach drivers will be cocooned for weeks in the so called closed loop with no direct physical access to the outside world. The authorities are so serious about keeping people in this closed loop that they've even warned Beijing residents not to help if they see an Olympic vehicle crash. There will be no spectators from outside China at the Olympics. People watching will be picked by the authorities and no shouting or cheering hmm. will be allowed. <laughs> Foreigners, including athletes, coming into the closed loop will have to be either removed back or quarantine for 21 days. And athletes will need to go through COVID tests every day and remain within the closed loop at all times. But even with all these precautions, an outbreak at the Olympics is still possible, especially an Omicron outbreak. Hong Kong has a three-week quarantine in place for people entering the city, and Omicron still got in. Omicron is a sneaky raccoon, making its way into the zero-COVID trash can. 
The close with leaf does have some advantage. We will at least for the Chinese back regime. Hard. Journalists coming to Beijing to cover the Olympics will be completely isolated from the rest of China. No pesky trips to interview Chinese human rights activists. Thanks for your question, Thomas. And thanks for supporting us on Patreon. If you like the show and want to see us keep going and get access to a bunch of other cool perks, check out patreon.com slash China Uncensored or chinauncensored.locals.com. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time. China calls itself great and glorious. You might have heard some of their propaganda lines. Don't believe them. They're lying. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. What do you really know about China? It's the most populous country in the world, and the second biggest economy. It's home to the Great Wall and pandas. But it's also home to the most brutal communist regime in the world today. And it spends billions of dollars on propaganda. Propaganda targeted at you. Many of the things people think they know about China aren't actually true. Here are five lies China told the world. Lie number five. The Communist Party lifted millions out of poverty. This is a big one. The Communist Party likes to claim it lifted 800 million people out of poverty. And once they get groups like the World Bank to repeat their lie, it's easy. Now, Chinese state media can cite the World Bank to perpetuate the lie. And if you visit the places the Chinese regime wants tourists to see, you might think China really is a rich, prosperous country. But it's mostly propaganda. They're hoping you don't read the fine print. Like, sure, the World Bank says China lifted people out of poverty, but they define poverty as the international poverty line of $1.90 per person per day. So if you make a dollar ninety-one cents, congratulations, you've been lifted out of poverty. You're now only considered low income. And according to Pew Research Center, China still has about 900 million people who are low income. People who make more than a buck ninety, but less than ten dollars a day. That's a day, you not an hour. A day. So things are still better in China than they were in the past, right? Well, maybe. It depends on how far back you go. 200 years ago, during the Qing Dynasty, China was a wealthy, prosperous nation. But then, China faced decades of war, the collapse of the Qing Dynasty, a civil war, a Japanese invasion, and then more civil war. And after the Communists won the civil war in 1949, that was followed by the absolute disaster unleashed by Mao Zedong. Chairman Mao collectivized farming. Tens of millions starved to death. Private business was all but illegal. Communism made pretty much everyone poor, except wealthy communist officials like Mao Zedong and friends. But even after Mao Tracking died, it wasn't the Communist Party that lifted people out of poverty. The party just backed off on the whole collectivization thing. They allowed people to go back to doing what they used to do before communism selling crops, doing business, and making a living for themselves. So hundreds of millions of Chinese people lifted themselves out of poverty. But economic reform did not come with social or political reform. People often are still forced to work long hours in unsafe conditions for low wages with no right to unionize. And the Communist Party still has control over every single business in China. Meanwhile, Taiwan, the free and democratic country, is much better off. Taiwan has four times the GDP per capita as China. So now when you hear someone say communism lifted millions out of poverty in China, you can tell them that's a lie. Stick around after the break because there are more lies to tell.
Welcome back. Lie number four. China is a developing country. Not possible. China is the world's second largest economy, but they still get the world to recognize them as a developing country. Sure, the Communist Party will brag they lifted 800 million people out of poverty, but then they'll say China is actually very poor, so it deserves handouts and concessions. Hmm. They got the World Trade Organization to hand out special provisions which give developing countries special rights. And those special provisions allow the Chinese Communist Party to outcompete countries like the US. As a developing country, China is allowed to discriminate against foreign companies by favoring higher priced and lower quality domestic providers. The US is not allowed to do that. The WTO also encourages developed countries like the US to share technology with developing countries. And then we get to a situation where US companies like Microsoft work with Chinese military universities. That's not treason or supporting crimes against humanity, it's just helping a developing country. These WTO rules are designed to help countries that are actually poor and disadvantaged. But China's economy is larger than the economy of every single developed country except the US. But yes, there are a lot of people in China, and like I said earlier, many of those people are still pretty poor. So, is China a developing country? It turns out the WTO has no official definition for developing country. Members announce for themselves whether they are developed or developing. And that's how the Chinese Communist Party games the system. The next time someone claims China is a developing country, you can tell them that's a lie. Lie number three. The Chinese Communist Party never invaded another country. Demons. This is one I hear get repeated a lot, usually in the context of, oh, why are you criticizing China? China is peaceful. China never invaded another country like the evil U.S. imperialists, which is a silly argument because it assumes you can't criticize more than one country. And believe me, I can. But it also simply isn't true. One of the first things the Communist Party did after seizing control of China was to launch an invasion of Tibet in 1950. Tibet at the time was internationally recognized as an independent country. Then, in 1954 and again in 1958, China tried to invade Taiwan. That was the first and second cross-strait crisis. The US got involved and even briefly considered using nuclear weapons against China. In 1962, China invaded this part of India called the Air Nakhon Pradesh claiming it was actually Chinese territory. That was the beginning of the Sino-Indian War. In 1979, China invaded Vietnam. That went about as well for China as it did for the US. Runs out on me. The Chinese Communist Party also threatened the UK to force them to hand over all of Hong Kong in 1997, even though the main island of Hong Kong fully belonged to the UK. In more recent times, the Chinese Communist Party has built artificial islands in disputed waters of the South China Sea and began putting missile launchers on them. Because even though several countries border the South China Sea, China claims all of it. It also continues to slowly take over territory on its land borders, like by building villages in territory that actually belongs to Bhutan and putting more troops on the border with India. And to this day, China still threatens to invade Taiwan by force. So next time someone tells you, well, China has never invaded another country, you'll know what to say. It's a lie. Lie number two, Falun Gong is an evil cult. What do you call a spiritual practice that involves people standing still and sitting still? Chinese yoga? Wrong. It's a dangerous threat to state power. Falun Gong is a Buddhist-y meditation practice that became popular in China during the 1990s. In 1999, Chinese government estimates put it at 70 to 100 million people practicing, which would have meant more people were practicing Falun Gong than were members of the Chinese Communist Party. So, then Chinese leader Jiang Zemin launched a bloody crackdown that continues today. But how do you get the Chinese people to agree to a massive crackdown on tens of millions of their innocent neighbors? Make people scared of them. Tell everyone Falun Gong isn't a Make up a bunch of lies about their beliefs. 
create propaganda videos, and then censor foreign media who say anything different. We'll be fine. According to actress and writer and activist Anastasia Ryan, official media defamed Falun Gong and dehumanized practitioners. Student leaders like me indoctrinated fellow students with hate propaganda. Hundreds of thousands of people were imprisoned and put through a process of torture called transformation, whose objective was to make them renounce their beliefs. If you'd like to learn more, check out my episode, What is Falun Gong and Why is it Persecuted? But anyway, next time someone tells you Falun Gong is an evil cult, you can tell them that's a lie. But this lie isn't just about Falun Gong. This is the same lie the Chinese Communist Party uses against any group they want to persecute. That's why the Chinese Communist Party calls Uyghurs terrorists. They call Tibetans separatists. And Hong Kong protesters secessionists. It's all to make people scared of these groups. And to make it seem like the party is justified when it imprisons, tortures, and kills them. And finally, lie number one. The coronavirus pandemic isn't China's fault. There are just so many lies here, it's hard to know where to start. But let's start with the original name. In January of 2020, Chinese state-run media were calling it, you remember? The Wuhan virus. Runs out on because Wuhan is the city where it was first discovered. China also lied when they said it was preventable and controllable. But when things began to spin out of control for China, they tried to rein it back in. First, they got the World Health Organization to stop calling it the Wuhan virus. Because, you know, that's racist. They instead, call it COVID-19. And COVID-19 could have started anywhere. And then they doubled down by spinning a tale that COVID-19 actually was started by the U.S. Army. And definitely not by this lab in Wuhan, called the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was specifically doing research on how to make Elephant. that coronaviruses more deadly to humans. This and yes, China no told labs to destroy all its early samples. Me. But they weren't covering anything up. It was done for biosafety reasons. It's now impossible to go back and pinpoint what was happening at the lab in the months before the outbreak. Not that it matters because Chinese state-run media says China has always been open and transparent on COVID-19 origins tracing. Frankly, the U.S. is manipulating it in order to blame China. But the worst lie is the lie Chinese officials told themselves. Isn't that always the truth? I'm talking about how, during the early weeks of the outbreak, starting December 2019, Chinese officials covered up the outbreak, choosing to suppress information so as not to embarrass party members. For 25 days, officials in Wuhan and Beijing concealed the extent of infection or refused to act on warnings. If they had acted instead of covering it up, they might have prevented a global pandemic. But you know, whoops. And then after that happened, well, what choice did they have but to spin a bunch of lies? So those are five lies China told the world. How many have you heard before? And have you ever gotten into an argument with someone over any of them? Let me know in the comments below. And before you go, it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports the show on the crowdfunding website Patreon or Locals. YouTube demonetizes pretty much all of our episodes, so they would have run us out of business years ago if it weren't for support from viewers like you. Grab one from the bottom here. Wow, this one is from November 2019. I don't know how this found that, but okay. Logan asks, what is Article 9 and how is it the anti-Bill of Rights? Now, Logan is referring to something retired General Robert Spaulding mentioned in an interview I did with him. It's actually usually referred to as Document Number 9. It's a leaked internal document circulated within the Chinese Communist Party in 2013. And it really is the anti-Bill of Rights. While the Bill of Rights guarantees freedoms we often take for granted, Document 9 calls things like media freedom and judicial independence dangerous Western values that the party has to fight against. It calls things like democracy and universal values extremely malicious. In other words, it's like the Chinese Communist Party's Declaration of Unindependence clearly stating the Chinese regime is the enemy of freedom and liberty. Something fun to remember. Thanks for your question, Logan. Thank you for watching. See you on Chris Chappell. See you next time.
China threatens to invade Taiwan. But while many focus on China's name, the real threat may be something entirely different. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by PC Doctor Toolbox. Protect your PC from software crashes, hardware failures, and the kind of glitches One that make shot. your life miserable. So, the Chinese Communist Party desperately wants to conquer Taiwan. Over the past year, the Chinese regime has sent wave after wave of jets near Taiwan. An attempted Chinese invasion is looking more and more likely. The Economist has called Taiwan we'll the most fine. dangerous it place on Earth. Big. Even more dangerous than a Walmart on Black Friday. Many US analysts focus on the rapid expansion of the Chinese Communist Party's Navy, known as the People's Liberation Next Army the Navy. Yes, the PLA Navy actually belongs to the Communist Party, not to the Chinese government. And China now has the largest Navy, even bigger than the United States. But there's a problem with focusing on China's Navy. It's easy for US military strategists What's to imagine wrong? a scenario where China sends its fleets to Taiwan, where it can be easily picked off by American torpedoes can. and missiles. So nothing to worry about, right? But Taiwan faces a much larger threat from China, one that the US would have a much harder time handling. I'll tell you what it is right after the break. Welcome back. The Chinese Navy might not be the biggest threat to Taiwan. Taiwan is an island less than 100 miles off the Chinese coast. Think about this. Would the US need its massive fleet in an invasion of Cuba? We'd probably use other tactics. That's why, according to the nonprofit Nuclear Threat Initiative, we could be facing a Taiwan missile crisis. China has thousands of missiles permanently pointed at Taiwan. That's not including the capabilities of the PLA rocket force. China could pulverize Taiwan's air defenses, runways, and communications. That would free the way for Chinese bombers, aircraft, and drones. The main purpose would be to pave a path for Chinese troops into Taiwan, either by helicopter or parachute. The Chinese Communist Party is definitely focusing on its parachute and helicopter. Exercises demonstrate that Chinese airborne forces are undertaking more challenging jumps, including at night, in coastal areas, and even over the water. According to state-run media reports, China has devoted its most advanced bomber, the Y-20, to paratrooper training. Backing up the paratroopers will be China's kill. enormous fleet of transport and attack helicopters. This report by a Russian expert on the field is called the Celestial Rotary Wing he claims China has 1,500 helicopters. And according to Lyle Goldstein, the director of Asia Engagement at Defense Priorities, between parachute and hellborn forces, China could quite reasonably hope to put 50,000 soldiers on the island in the first wave, and well over 100,000 in the first 24 hours. That won't be easy, but Chinese strategists are acutely aware that these first assault waves will suffer very high casualties they consider this a necessary cost to obtain victory. They call that the Zap Brannigan strategy. These troops could be further resupplied by helicopter fleets or even heavy drones developed specifically for that purpose. What this means is an invasion of Taiwan might not be a sea battle with a possible beach invasion, but a bloody infantry fight in Taiwan. And it looks like this is exactly what the Chinese Communist Party has been preparing for. They've been training soldiers in stealth crew insertion, night operations, sniper tactics, securing hard targets, urban combat, and mountain operations. They've also invested in small, maneuverable craft like this amphibious all-terrain vehicle. These vessels have speed, stealth, and low cost, but perhaps their most notable virtue is their small size, allowing them to be carried and launched by almost any civilian Each vessel. Star including Both ships of China's vanquished. enormous fishing. But meanwhile, the U.S. has been investing in expensive high-tech ships that take too long to build. 
as we discussed on a recent episode of America Uncovered. Has China's Navy already beaten the U.S. Navy? I'll put a link to that below if you want to check it out. All this is to say, the best thing the U.S. could do is to prevent a Chinese invasion from happening in the first place. And the U.S. can do that by showing strong support for Taiwan and cutting China off from U.S. money. Because the alternative hmm. is a bloody war the Chinese Communist Party will have no problem fighting. And this episode is sponsored by PC Doctor Toolbox. Computer and software crashes, hardware sword failures, and general sword. computer slowdowns are way too much. And they can happen at the worst times, like when you're at a business meeting, or when China is in the middle of invading Taiwan. It could happen any time. And that's why if you're using a PC, you should also be using PC Doctor Toolbox. Stop crashes and other system problems before they happen. And we have a 50% off discount just for China Uncensored viewers. Use the link and coupon code below to take advantage of this limited time offer. I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching China Uncensored. Substitute for true strength. I will prove myself to you. China completes a massive underwater tunnel. Brutal COVID lockdowns in the city of Xi'an. And is Wall Street finally turning on the Chinese Communist Party? That and more on this week's China News Headlines. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. China Happy has completed of construction of its longest there underwater no tunnel. It's called the Taihu Tunnel. And it's over six and a half miles long. Sounds like a long time to spend holding your breath. What? I want to make a wish. Construction on the tunnel began in 2018. The total cost was more than one and a half million dollars. It was built under Lake Taihu in Jiangsu province. The ceilings have been outfitted with LED lights to prevent driver fatigue. But they set aside a lot of money for the upkeep of those lights. The Taihu Tunnel is part of a much larger highway that links Shanghai with Nanjing, Jiangsu's capital. The Taihu Tunnel is China's longest underwater tunnel, although it's not the world's longest. That honor goes to the Chunnel, the channel tunnel that connects England and France, which is 23 and a half miles long. But as you know, the Chinese Communist Party is a fan of massive infrastructure projects. We're talking about things like the Three Gorges the Dam. For one, it's a matter of national prestige. But these massive construction projects also give an artificial boost to GDP. Local officials need to stay in power. But on a deeper level, it ties directly to communist ideology. The idea that man must struggle Light against everything, including nature. This is quite literally the Communist Party trying to show it can dominate nature. Such a beautiful this is also the strategy of China's taking with COVID. It's not working out, so. Sorry for the break. Welcome back. Great news. China's zero COVID policy definitely works, so you should try it in your country. China is reporting a major drop in cases in Xi'an. Last month, keeping to their zero COVID policy with almost religious zeal, Chinese authorities locked down the city of Xi'an, a city of 13 million people. And now, new COVID cases are dropping in Xi'an as authorities move people with COVID out of Xi'an. Once they move everyone with COVID out of Xi'an, then there are no cases in Xi'an. It's not a joke, that's what they're actually doing. It's just one more way for officials to lie about COVID cases in China. Of course, China's authorities have been lying about their coronavirus numbers since the beginning. And now they're trapped by their zero COVID policy lie. China has never had zero COVID, but they have to keep pretending they do. And to keep up the lie, they're making the Chinese people suffer. Tales of anguish are coming out of locked down Xi'an. 
Hospitals we'll won't fine. see you it if you can't sad. prove you don't have a virus. Yeah. A woman eight months yeah. pregnant miscarried after being refused care until she had tested negative for the virus. She had actually previously tested negative, but her test had expired by four hours. So the hospital made her wait outside until she got another negative test. They finally let her in after she started bleeding heavily on the sidewalk outside the hospital. And now, those hospital workers have been fired. This is the kind of stupid thing that happens under China's system. The hospital workers denied the woman entry because they were afraid of getting in trouble for letting in someone who didn't have a negative test. Then, they got in trouble because they didn't let her in. With so much riding on people testing negative, Xi'an was thrown into chaos after its main COVID app crashed. People had to use the app to show their health code, which proved they had tested negative for COVID, to enter hospital. With the system down, no one could do that. Plus all the other things you needed that app for. No one could prove their status. And since everyone has to stay in their homes, food supply is becoming an issue. It's become such an issue that residents of Xi'an have resorted to bartering to survive. A box of cigarettes can be exchanged for a cabin, or a used iPhone 13 mini plus an old tablet traded for a bag of rice. Now you might think China's zero COVID policy is brutal and ineffective, but we still have Western media outlets like the Washington Post saying China's zero COVID policy has been largely effective. It's almost as if the owner of the Washington Post would love a world where most people have to stay at home and have everything delivered to them. But <laughs> that can't be right. Coming up after the break, are U.S. investors finally wising up about the Chinese Communist Party? Welcome back. A big reason the Communist Party is still in power today is the constant influx of American tax. Even as the Chinese Communist Party was openly declaring war on America, Wall Street investment firms like BlackRock have continued to invest in China and convinced other investors to do it too. But that may be changing. Goldman Sachs is now warning China will keep its borders closed to the outside world for all of 2022 another part of China's zero COVID policy. And it finally has some people saying China is uninvested. Bond King Jeffrey Gunlock said, I've never invested in China I'm long mistaken. or short. Why is that? I don't trust the data. I don't trust the relationship between the United States and China anymore. I think that investments in China could be confiscated. I think there's a risk of that. Ian Bremmer, president and founder at Eurasia Group, said the ability to live with the virus, an extremely easily transmissible virus that isn't as fatal, is the exact opposite of China's policy of zero COVID. Zero COVID will not work for them. They're going to stick with it. And even Mad Money's Jim Cramer says it's impossible to recommend Chinese stocks in a hostile communist regime. I think we should be referring to China more as a hostile communist regime. You like the ring of that. In fact, Kramer went a lot further than that. He called Chinese leader Xi Jinping a terrorist dictator. Is there a price, though, at which you would buy into any of these companies? I mean, we're looking well, why, at a screen right now. Why would right I now. do that? Why would I do I'm, that? I'm just asking the question. I mean, you you can make the argument that at some point the price is, is low enough that, 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 that the risk that it continues to go lower is reduced. I, well, I, I can do that, but that's irresponsible of me to do that. I, I can't recommend rec buying stocks in a communist regime that is a totalitarian dictator who's not just human rights, but is doing much more than that to be able to solidify his power. I think it's irresponsible for me to come out here and say, you know what? At 108, it's fully discounted that the man is a terrorist t uh, t uh, dictator. I, I can't tell you. At 97, it doesn't matter that he's killing a lot of people and that he's retraining people and there's concentration camps. And don't worry about it. I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I, I just, I can't do it. And Jim Cramer's moral backbone through the three sides today. You know, I've done my share of ragging on Cramer. Only a few months ago, he was telling people to buy Chinese stock. But at least he's changed his business. So good for him. We need more of this. 
But not everyone is treating China like a hostile communist regime. Elon Musk and Tesla opened a showroom in Xinjiang. You know, where there's all that genocide. I say if Elon Musk wants to go to the moon, he can stay there. Taiwan is paying it forward. Remember earlier last year, when the Chinese regime boycotted Taiwanese pineapples, and the rest of the world stepped up and bought loads of Taiwanese pineapples. Well, China has now targeted Lithuania because of the country's support for Taiwan. So when China banned Lithuanian rum, Taiwan stepped in and bought over 20,000 bottles. Let me be clear, the government of Taiwan just bought a literal boatload of rum which is great news for Taiwanese pirates. But Taiwan's support doesn't stop there. In addition to rum, people wrong? are buying Lithuanian beer and cars. And Taiwan is vowing to invest $200 million in Lithuania as the CCP further wages economic warfare. Even Lithuanians who live in Taiwan are getting the rock star treatment. The Washington Post talked to one businessman who found. says that people clap when they find out he's from Lithuania. Nobody claps when they find out I'm from America. You need to work on that, America. But one thing that America is doing, right? Supporting Lithuania. In a meeting this week with German officials, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called out China's bullying of Lithuania. Blinken said the issue wasn't just about Lithuania, but about countries fighting back against China's economic coercion. He said the U.S. and allies I would work to diversify supply chains and counter this economic blackmail. And the U.S. government has already started making good on this front. Two months ago, the U.S. signed a $600 million export credit agreement with Lithuania. Of course, China lashed out this week at U.S. support for Lithuania, but what else is new? Actually, here's something. The Chinese Communist Party usually gets mad at Western media for covering stories. We'll be fine. Now, they're it getting mad at Western thing. media for not covering the story. Last month, China's ambassador to the U.S. held a fireside chat with major U.S. media outlets. And then, no one reported on it. Probably because listening to a Chinese official regurgitate talking points isn't that interesting. But then Chinese state-run media started complaining that I no one reported on this really patient. important story. Just can't win with these people. And it's a weekly thing. The situation in Hong Kong gets worse. Last week I told you about the police raid that shut down one of the last independent pro-democracy media outlets in Hong Kong. The death of independent media in Hong Kong began with the closure of that raid. The Hong Kong chief executive Carrie Lam wants you to know that press freedom in Hong Kong is doing just fine. I read news about uh, because of the closure of um, uh, online media, uh, press freedom in Hong Kong um, faces extinction, or Hong Kong free, free press faces collapse. Actually, I just could not accept that sort of allegations. Uh, but nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. And journalists and media organizations like all of us have to respect and comply with the law. I've got to say, I'm getting some serious Dolores Umbridge vibes from Carrie Lam. Japan and Australia have signed a historic hey, treaty friend. that might just irk China. It's a defense pact that will see Japan's self-defense force and Australia's military work together a lot more from now on. It definitely has nothing to do with deterring any country in particular. And we could not do this show without the support of viewers like you on the crowdfunding website Patreon or the community subscription platform Local. What with YouTube demonetization and many companies work with someone who criticizes the Chinese regime, this show would have gone out of business years ago if it weren't for the support of fans I call the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army. To thank them, I answer a question at the end of each episode. Today's question comes from Black Label on Patreon. Let's say the CCP collapses it's going to be tomorrow. Okay. Who do you think is the priority country they are going to try to take we'll down be with? Fine. It wasn't that ah, that's a question that shows a lot of insight into the nature of the Chinese Communist Party. If the party collapses, they will lash out. First, the party has collected loads of blackmail from 
powerful people from around the world through hacking or good old hunting. I imagine if it came to it, the party would use that blackmail for protection. And if that didn't work out, they would take them down with them. But what country would the CCP take down with them? Probably China. They would do everything they could to salt the earth in the wake of their destruction. The party always said, there's no new China without the Communist Party. That's not just propaganda, it's also a threat. Whether that comes to pass will all depend on how the party ultimately falls. And one day, it will. Thanks for your question, Black Label, and thank you for your support. If you like this show and want to see us keep going and get access to a bunch of other cool perks, check out patreon.com slash chinauncensored or chinauncensored.locals.com. Join the China Uncensored 50 Cent Army and stick it to the Chinese Communist Party, a hostile communist regime. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time. Party wants to know what you think about China. So they're tracking you online. <laughs>
They're in vocational training centers. Sometimes I wish I could talk like the Chinese Communist Party. No, sir, I did not crash into your car. I was giving you a vehicular fist bump. And like a vehicular fist bump, public opinion guidance isn't cheap. It's clear from even a few examples that the Communist Party has spent millions on this online surveillance. That includes paying more than $300,000 for a software program that mines Twitter and Facebook to create a database of foreign journalists and academics. Another $200,000 for a program that analyzes Western chatter on Hong Kong and Taiwan. And operating an entire cyber center in Xinjiang that's used to monitor Uyghur language content abroad. The party also spends money buying and maintaining foreign social media accounts for Chinese police and propaganda. Wait, is that why I keep getting friend requests from not the Ministry of Public Security? But that's not all. The Washington Post spoke to people who are involved in public opinion analysis in Beijing, and they described software systems that automatically collect and store Facebook and Twitter data in real time on domestic Chinese servers. Both Facebook and Twitter ban organizations doing this without authorization. So the question is, do Facebook and Twitter not know what the Chinese regime is doing? Or have they authorized it? Both options are kind of terrifying. And remember when I told you earlier these software systems include alarms for negative content? That's not all. They also report negative content directly to a 24-hour hotline run by the Communist Party's censorship apparatus. And those reports include the details of individual social media users. What does the Chinese Communist Party do with those personal details? So you have to break. Welcome back. Remember last year when Chinese leader Xi Jinping called on officials to present a more lovable image of China? And some experts were like, hey, this means China is going to tone things down be reasonable. Yeah, no. They totally misread what Xi was saying. Because in the same speech, Xi Jinping also called for officials to develop international public opinion guidance. Remember, public opinion guidance means using censorship and propaganda to control what people say. So she was saying Chinese officials should present a lovable image of China by shutting down anyone who presents an unlovable image of China. I want you. That includes and people who criticize you. the Chinese Communist Party on Western How social is it media. Even possible? And the party isn't just targeting prominent outspoken activists. Back in 2020, a Chinese student who was going to the University of Minnesota was jailed for six months in China over tweets he posted in the U.S. The New York Times spoke to another Chinese student who had set up what she thought was an anonymous Twitter account. But when she went back to her hometown in China last year, police tracked her down. They knocked on her parents' door, took her to the police station, and told her to delete her Twitter account. Even after she moved abroad, the police called her and her mother to see if she had visited any human rights websites. Getting in trouble with the police for visiting human rights websites is like getting in trouble with your dentist for flossing your mouth. It's what you're supposed to do as a decent human being, although most of us don't do this often. Should. And this student wasn't the only Chinese person with abroad who was targeted by police. Because even if Chinese police can't threaten you, they can always go after fine. your family. It wasn't that when a Chinese student living in Taiwan criticized the Chinese police, both of his parents disappeared for 10 days. Meanwhile, a Chinese student studying in Canada was harassed by the Chinese police over an anonymous Twitter account with two followers. He had only tweeted three times. The Chinese police questioned his father and then directly called him on WeChat. The police told him that they had tracked him by his IP address and knew where he lived in Canada. When the student went to the Canadian police for help, they told him they couldn't do anything about it because it was happening in China. They didn't even open a police report. The student deleted his tweets, all three of them. 
Now, all these cases involve Chinese police harassing ethnic Chinese people. And it makes sense that they would target them. China's Communist Party wants to silence dissent among Chinese people so they can lie about how all Chinese people love the party. Plus, it's just easier to threaten to Chinese people who have family back in China. They do the same thing to Uyghurs and Tibetans, too. Basically, if you have loved ones in China, the Chinese regime will treat them like hostages. But while the party is starting with people who are easier to threaten, their expanding surveillance shows the party is coming for foreigners, too. Uh, Shelly, why did you put up a photo of me there? Does this mean they're gonna find out about the Beanie Babies? What can I say, I'm a 90s kid. The point is, no one is safe from Chinese surveillance. The New York Times spoke to a contractor who does surveillance work for the Chinese authorities. The Times called him a specialist in tracking people living in the U.S. According to the specialist, a single tweet or Facebook post could be enough to attract official attention. He said he had been assigned to investigate Chinese undergraduates studying in the U.S., a Chinese-American policy analyst who is a U.S. citizen, and journalists who had worked in China. He showed the Times a sample document that included personal and career information and professional and family connections to China, as well as a statistical analysis of the reach of the person in So how does this guy get such detailed information? He said he used voter registries, driver's license records, and hacked databases on the dark web to pinpoint the people behind the posts. Personal photos posted online can be used to infer addresses and friends. Hold on. He uses voter registries and personal photos? Kind of ironic that the greatest danger to U.S. democracy could come from people posting I voted selfies on Facebook. But it's not just dangerous because of who's being tracked by the Chinese regime. It's also dangerous because of who's doing the tracking. I'll explain more after the break. Welcome back. It's not surprising that Chinese police are buying these surveillance systems to track people on Facebook and Twitter. But what is unexpected is who's running these systems. In many cases, it's being done by Chinese state-run media, like the People's Daily. The People's Daily Online, which provides one of the country's largest contract public opinion analysis services, won dozens of projects that include overseas social media data collection services for police, judicial authorities, Man, communist party mine. organizations, and other departments. Right Some of the documents mention the East Daily having overseas servers a as a big plus. What's one that means they can monitor people overseas without having to deal with China's great firewall. But it's not just the People's Daily. My favorite Chinese state-run media, the Global Times, won a half million dollar contract to provide a China-related foreign media and journalist opinion monitoring system for China's foreign ministry. Close to 40% of the Global Times monitoring unit staffers are senior Global Times reporters. In other words, the Global Times is using reporters as spies. In 2020, the Trump administration designated most major Chinese state media in the U.S. as foreign missions. That means the U.S. government recognizes these outlets as an arm of the Chinese state, just like the Chinese embassy. They also put a cap on how many employees these state-run medias could have in the U.S. At the time, the Trump administration was criticized for stifling press freedom. But as these reports from the Washington Post and the New York Times show, Chinese state-run media workers aren't journalists. They're propaganda workers for a hostile state. Some of them don't just push propaganda, they also spy on people for the Chinese regime. And they're gathering information that's used by Chinese police to threaten people who criticize China. You know, for years we were told that China might be strict with its own people inside China, but don't worry. The Chinese authorities don't care what happens outside of China. They just want to be left alone. If we don't interfere with them, they won't interfere with us. That was a stupid lie. And now we're facing the consequences. I'm not saying people should stop criticizing the Chinese Communist Party. That's what they want. In fact, this just means we need to further expose the party. Just make sure you're doing your best to protect your beanie baby.
And now it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports the show. The crowdfunding website's Patreon or the community subscription platform Locals. Today's question comes from Dahoover on Locals. What do you think would happen if Xi Jinping decided to go and visit Taiwan one day? It would be quite embarrassing if Taiwan declined his visa. Do you think they would? Well, Da Hoover, Xi Jinping would never visit Taiwan with one exception. You see, the Chinese Communist Party can't admit Taiwan is a separate country that Xi would need permission to go to. They don't acknowledge Taiwan's government at all. So Xi would never do an official visit to Taiwan because that would be admitted that Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, is equal in rank to Xi. Now, in 2015, Xi Jinping did meet with then-president of Taiwan, Ma Ying-jeou, but they met in Singapore. Things were very different back then. Ma was trying to open up relations with mainland China, especially economic relations. He requested the meeting with Xi. And the Communist Party thought they would just be able to subvert Taiwan into becoming part of China using the one country, two systems policy they used in Hong Kong. But that didn't happen. And after the Hong Kong protest, Chinese people won't accept one country, two systems. At this point, the only way she will visit Taiwan is after a successful invasion by the People's Liberation Army. So let's hope he never gets there. Thanks for your question, Da Hoover, and thank you for your support on Locals. And if you'd like me to answer your question on the show while supporting the work we do, head over to patreon.com slash China Uncensored or local.com slash China Uncensored. I'm Dylan Chris Chappell. See you next time. Teachers in China questioned the Communist Party, and their punishment is shocking. Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Did you know that the People's Republic of China wrote a joke into its constitution? It's true. Article 35 says, citizens shall enjoy freedom of speech. That's a real knee slap. Because actually, the Chinese Communist Party does not allow freedom of speech. Perhaps they're afraid that if people have free speech, they'll see that the entire Communist Party sits on a throne of lies. In fact, they're so uptight that they don't even allow teachers to ask questions. A One teacher found out last month. December 14th was the National Memorial Day for the victims of the Nanjing Massacre in China. It's also known as the Rape of Nanjing. Japanese soldiers brutally killed and raped at least tens of thousands of civilians in Nanjing. The death toll is disputed. It I happened in 1937 me. after Japan invaded China. This video of a teacher named Song Gan Yi went viral on Chinese social media platform Weibo. The student recording the video can be heard cursing under his breath and saying, sure, as in, this video is sure to get this teacher in trouble. Each stop, a foe, hey, I got you, friend. Right now. Uh, 
。战争怎么来的？<laughs> What she says actually might make sense, but unfortunately for her, she was in China when she said it. The Chinese Communist Party does not appreciate it when people spread this thing, especially because the Communist Party uses the Nanjing Massacre for anti-Chinese propaganda. As this video went viral, many nationalistic Chinese netizens demanded Song Gengyi be investigated. And so Song was reported to the authorities. Later that day, the school leader, Shanghai Aurora Vocational College, posted this on their official social media account. It says, "According to our school's investigation, Song Gengyi made a false statement during her news interview course, causing serious adverse social impacts." And then they fired her. So. A teacher lost her job for causing serious adverse social impacts, like teaching students to think critically. One of China's major state-run media, People's Daily, also chimed in to make things clear to members of the public who were following Sun Gangyi's saga. The Nanjing massacre has killed more than 300,000 compatriots, and the evidence is as strong as a mountain. To speculate and question the truth of history is to be a teacher in vain. To forget the suffering and deny the evil deeds of other countries is to be a countryman in vain. Educators are welcome to seek the truth, but to speak on behalf of wrongdoers and disregard the suffering of the nation—how can such ignorance and virtue be worthy of guiding the next generation? Wow. Imagine a state-run newspaper coming after you as an individual teacher. After this, Song Gengyi even received nasty threats over the past. Of course, authorities were right when they said Song's lectures caused serious adverse social impacts, but only because of how they handled them. Explain after. Welcome back. Shortly after the video of Song Gengyi went viral. So did a 27-year-old elementary school teacher named Li Tiantian from Xiangxi, Hunan Province. Li received a lot of attention for a social media post she wrote supporting Song. I support Teacher Song. I do not want to be the silent majority. As a colleague, I think there is no problem with her lectures. The problems are her students. The school that expelled her. Official reports. Silent intellectuals. Song Gengyi's words did not instigate or provoke, nor did she oppose or obliterate the Nanjing Massacre. She only proposed to respect lives and respect the dead. Is this wrong? Obviously, those things. Li Tiantian's post was deleted from social media, but not soon enough, because a lot of people had already passed it around, and it started getting the public's attention. Chinese authorities knew just what to do with the teacher who defended someone else's freedom of speech. They sent her to a mental hospital. Sending people to mental hospitals is one of the ways Chinese authorities make dissidents go away. It makes sense too because they assume you'd have to be crazy to go against the Communist Party. China's mental health law allows involuntary admission into mental hospitals under the consent. Of police authority. In other words, whether you need psychiatric help can be determined by the Ministry of Public Security, not mental health professionals. That policy is awfully convenient when you want to paint someone as mentally ill in order to shut them up. An online user had posted images of Li Tian crying for help as she described a group of people coming in with needle injections before taking her to the mental hospital. This text message that circulated online reads, "I've been taken against my will to a mental hospital by the Yongshun Public Security Bureau. I'm contacting you through a phone I, I hid in my underwear. Please save me. Can't talk much. The battery will die soon. Please save me." I should also mention that Li Tiantian was four months pregnant during all of this. This isn't the first time Li Tiantian had gotten into trouble. In 2019, Li had posted online a reflection of her experiences teaching in a rural village in China, titled 
a group of rural children being destroyed. In it, she merely criticizes how the school was less interested in educating children than in passing an official inspection. Nothing in it was particular, but it did, in a roundabout way, point out the true priorities of socialist education with Chinese characteristics. But her post got a lot of attention. For honor and so, Li Tian Tian had her teaching courses reduced and was required to report to her higher ups about any travel plans. This is how censorship works in China. No one knows what or when something will be censored. And when things make their way to the public eye, the Chinese censorship apparatus panics. And that sometimes makes it crash and burn. I'll tell you what happened after the break. Welcome back. Such Chinese netizens were all concerned about Li Tianjin's disappearance, but the authorities knew what to do. They got her family to consent to Li being checked into the hospital for psychiatric treatment. And wouldn't you know it, Hu Shi Jin, the recently retired editor-in-chief of my favorite state-run media, The Global Times, shared a video on Weibo of Li Tianjin's mother. <laughs> You know, there's something about the way she was speaking that seems, well, let's say I sympathize with how hard it is to read off the telephone. And this is yet another tactic used to dissuade the centers in China. The authorities in China will find a way to get family members involved, either by threatening them or demanding that they refute rumors. A week later, on December 26th, a Weibo post allegedly from Li Tian Tian was released to the public. Hello everyone, I'm Li Tian Tian. I just came out of the hospital. I will reply to everyone as soon as possible. Thank you for your concern for me and your attention to this matter. Now my condition is still recovering and my mental state is also poor, so I may not be able to reply to too many messages or accept media interviews in a short time. I hope you will understand. However, Li Tian Tian will always be Li Tian Tian and words are the embodiment of my spirit and personality. She put the words hospital and recovering in quotation marks. That's not reassuring. Comments on social media are also doubtful. Li Tian Tian is not mentally ill. I hope that she will speak up as soon as possible and return to normal. A certain group of people wants to say that Li Tian Tian is not mentally ill and should not be put in the mental hospital. The other group wants to say that Li Tian Tian is mentally ill so as to justify her support of Song Gong Yi. Do they really think claims of mental illness will wash away what she said about the Nanjing massacre? And here's what's ironic. Who is next on By making a big block? deal about Song Gong Yi asking questions about the Nanjing massacre and locking up Li Tian Tian for supporting her, China's censorship apparatus turned it into a popular discussion topic. And now, a lot of people are asking inconvenient questions. The Chinese Communist Party is going to have to open up a lot of new mental hospitals. Now it's time for me to answer an inconvenient question from one of you. Fan supports China Uncensored on Patreon or Locals. Tyler Howe on Patreon asks, What would happen if Russia invades Ukraine and China invades Taiwan at the same time? Could this work in their favor to split the distribution of U.S. military personnel? Uh, please don't give Russia and China any ideas. One invasion is a normal war, but coordinated invasions on different parts of the globe, that could be the start of a world war. And I think humanity has had enough of those. Thank you very much. Thanks for your question, Tyler. 
Be like Tyler and support China Uncensored with a dollar or more per episode on Patreon. Or become a paying subscriber on Locals. In each place, you get different perks. But in both, you can ask me questions, I'll answer them. Once again, I'm Chris Chapel. Thanks for watching China Uncensored. Is Xi Jinping losing his grip on power? New signs the Chinese Communist Party may be getting fed up with him. Happy New Year and welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. And hey, if you haven't heard, our merch store is live. Get yourself a t-shirt like this one or one of our many other t-shirts and mugs. Visit ChinaUncensored.tv slash merchandise to see the selection and support the show. The link is below. There is rampant political infighting within the highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party and signs of the war are spilling over into Chinese propaganda. Is this a sign that certain segments of the party are turning against Chinese leader Xi Jinping? I think it's time for another episode of everyone's favorite Chinese Actually, communist I'm soap opera, here. General Hostility. Previously on General Hostility. Life or death. The war I between Xi Jinping one. and a political faction tied to former Chinese leader and sausage-toed Jiang Zemin is coming to a head. A major meeting of the Chinese Communist Party is less than a year away. Will Xi Jinping manage to hold on to power and be declared chairman for life? Or will his ambitions end in ruins at the hands of his greatest foe? At the end of 2022, China will hold the 20th Party Congress. Everyone expects Xi Jinping to use the event to extend his rule indefinitely. He's been laying the ground for that. A few months ago, he remade the Communist Party's history in his image, using what's called a historical resolution. We did a full episode about that, so check it out for some background. But basically, she rewrote himself as the savior of the Chinese Communist Party. Here's the story from his perspective. Mao was, like, overall pretty great, even though he screwed things up during the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping, who came after Mao, got things back on track with his initiative called Reform and Opening Up. But now, Reform and Opening Up is over, and it's Xi Jinping who will achieve true greatness for China. What with his bold vision of the party's comprehensive leadership and his exciting Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Ever since Xi put out his historical resolution, State-run People's Daily has been running a propaganda series promoting it. But a lot of people were surprised when this piece came out on December 9th. It talks about all the great things that happened under reform and opening up, under former leaders Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao. But in the 4,000-character-long essay, it doesn't once mention Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thought, or his new era. Oh, and it was written by a propaganda writer who worked mainly under prominent members of the Jiang faction. Is this a sign that people in the Communist Party are getting fed up with Xi Jinping? Is this the beginning of the end? More after the break. Welcome back. So this article that makes no mention of Xi Jinping was written by Chu Xingqia, according to Sino Insight. Chu served in the Jiang faction-influenced propaganda apparatus and worked under several Jiang faction provincial party bosses during the Jiang faction's era of dominance. Is that a sign there's discontent within the party about Xi's rule? On the surface, it definitely could be seen that way. And certainly, a lot of China analysts are taking it that way. But there could be more going on. For context, you have to look at this piece that came out a few days later. 
it's another in the series of propaganda articles about Xi's historical revolutions. And the key point is comprehensive leadership. That's very different from the collective leadership. The